Welcome inside the den. Uh, this is our first episode, Chris, and uh, we're excited to have a new audience out there. I listen to our podcast. We're obviously going to be discussing Nevada football today. Uh, I like your pen on the the collar right there. Is that going to be yes. your look moving forward? Uh, you know, uh, do you, <laughs> Chris, do you remember um, the defense coordinator for the Patriots, Matt Patricia? I do, yeah. He had the uh, pencil in the, the ear. Uh, didn't do yeah. so well with the Lions, but the pencil worked when he was with the Patriots. Yeah. So. Well, you know, ink is mightier than the sword, so okay. I'm going with the pen. There we go. Yeah. I'm just hoping that my son watches this. He's a big YouTube fan. Uh, I know we don't have Mr. Beast following, but thank you. If you are watching, one day we will get up to Mr. Beast following. So um, he has subscribed to Nevada Sportsnet uh, and our YouTube page. Hopefully, hopefully we give you reason to subscribe as we break down the Nevada football season heading into 2023. Definitely, definitely a younger demographic. I mean, just up their alley, we're talking Nevada football, you know, just – Ken Wilson, the, the the entire regime, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, a ten year old boy's dream to be talking <laughs> about this. Yeah, uh, my son's eight. He doesn't really care about football all that much, but we know there are a lot of Wolfpack fans out there, and the hope is this is a better season than we saw last year. I mean, you really look at what Nevada did last year: two and ten overall. That's not Nevada football. 0-8 in conference, that's not Nevada football. 10-game losing streak, that's not Nevada football. Scored just 18.8 points per game, that's not Nevada football. More interceptions and touchdown passes, that's not Nevada football. So we'll see if the Wolfpack can flush all of those stats and maybe have some uh, more proud accomplishments at the end of the season a few months down the line. Definitely, definitely. You know, it was, it was a rough year to, to watch them last year, but, you know, it's, it's a new regime, a new energy um, kind of falling in the steps of Chris Alt and, you know, that, that old regime that was so successful within the pistol offense. Now, obviously, we're going to get into, like, the ins and outs of the entire roster, and, you know, we'll, we'll dive into it. Trust us, guys. We, we got you on, on Nevada football. But, you know, um, it's it, it should be an interesting season. You know, we're now, what, you know, 10 days um, out from, you know, uh, kickoff against USC. You know, tough matchup with Caleb Williams, <laughs> but – um, it's, it's a new season, um, and that brings new hope. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Nevada has a better roster. The way I've kind of, uh, you know, talked to people about it, it seemed like last year, Ken Wilson's first year at Nevada, he kind of inherited a roster that was like a 2-7 off suit, and he was told, okay, go win this poker match, when he didn't really have the ammunition behind him. This year is probably more like a 9-10 suited, so not an elite hand heading into the season, but the roster is in a better spot. There are ways where Nevada can win football games. They've added a bunch of Pac-12 transfers. They have more depth and competition at a number of positions throughout the roster. So I think it was a legitimate excuse or explanation last year why they were not able to win games just based on the roster inherited. I feel like this year there are still some holes and question marks, but the roster is in a much better place where if Nevada does go and play to its potential, it could be playing in a bowl game at the end of the year. And I think that would kind of be the mark of a strong season is if Nevada's playing in a bowl, they're back in the postseason, they're making progress on that route needed to get to a championship. That's the ultimate goal. You know, we, we've been around this team, um, you know, like this past offseason. They've been preaching, you know, 1% better every day. You know, that's an, it's an old saying, but it, it's true. You know, like these guys are, are, are you know, taking each day and, and trying to, to attempt themselves, like to, to better suit themselves um, for much more success than they had last year which is very little. Yeah, I mean, I think the mark of success is that you get better every year. Now, how quick does that come? Obviously, you see Marcus Arroyo at UNLV. He increased his win total every year and was fired after three seasons. So I think there's a little bit more pressure to win more immediately than in the past. In the past, you got four seasons to prove you could do it. I don't think Ken Wilson is by any means on a hot seat, but if Nevada goes out and goes 2-10 and 10 again, if they go winless in conference, then there are going to be people asking, you know, should we make a change after two years? Um, I don't think that's going to be the case. I think Nevada's going to go out there, and you look at the schedule, I think there are some wins on that schedule. Um, but they have to show that they are getting better. They have to show um, that the offense is a lot more explosive than we saw last year. I mean, 18.8 points per game, that was the second fewest in Nevada's FBS era. That's back to 1992. That was not acceptable. They were also 10th in the Mountain West in scoring defense, 31 points per game. I think they played better than that, but the offense put them in a lot of bad uh, situations. So, um, you know, to be able to show that you're making progress year over year, is really the key when you're building a program, but that progress can't be from two wins to three wins. I think a minimum this year, you gotta get the five wins to show, okay, things are heading in the right direction and this is the right guy for the job moving forward. Obviously, Nevada football means a ton to Ken Wilson. Came here in the 1980s, was a part of a lot of championships as an assistant coach, served as an assistant athletic director, went away to the Pac-12 for nine years before coming back. He really wants Nevada football to be good. He's really invested in making this program great. Um, the, the question is, can he do that over the next couple of years? And certainly I think the roster, like we said, puts him in a better position to maybe make that happen this year. 
Definitely, and we, we will jump into that. You know, Vegas currently has Nevada's odds, uh, of, like their wins, their over-unders at two and a half. Um, both you and I probably feel comfortable that they're probably going to hit that over this year. Um, but to kind of segue, we are going to jump into, like, entire overview of, of the Nevada um, football season ahead and uh, kind of just talk about their hierarchy and some key departures, key losses and whatnot. Um, Chris, let, why don't we start with, with the hierarchy um, of Nevada football? Well, yeah, you have Ken Wilson, uh, you know, so like we said, he almost almost three decades as an assistant coach, went to Washington State in 2012. He was actually offered a position on the staff by Brian Pullian. Initially wasn't offered a position, did some really good recruiting. Brian Pullian then wanted to keep him. But Ken Wilson said, if I want to be a head coach, I got to go learn how to do this at a different place because he had been at Nevada his entire career, basically. Went to Washington State for six years. He was there with Mike Leach. He meant a lot to him. From there, he went on to Oregon, three years with the Ducks. After two years, he was actually offered the Montana State job at the FCS level, an elite FCS job, but he really wanted to hold out for an FBS position, so he got a raise. He got a uh, bump in his title, the co-defensive coordinator, after his third year with Oregon. Obviously, Jay Norvell leaves Nevada to go to Colorado State. I think the Wolfpack was looking for somebody who would be loyal to Nevada, and certainly Ken Wilson can be that. So your first year as a head coach, your first opportunity in your late 50s, that's a little bit unusual. Usually you'll get the chance before that, but um, he's gotten that chance now. Uh, you know, his uh, son played for Nevada football, Tyler, who works in the Wolfpack Athletic Department now. So there's a lot of ties to Nevada that make Ken Wilson want to make this program great, and uh, we'll see if he can do that over the next couple years. Definitely, definitely. He has he has some of those hallmarks of, of quality leadership um, and and steering the right guys in his direction. And he has surrounded himself with uh, some some talented um, coordinators and, and assistants. Um, that, you know, like and to mention uh, Derek Sage, uh, another local guy that uh, you know kind of made his way through college football and, and back to Nevada. Uh, yeah, that's the offensive corner. It's all about Sage. Yeah, Reed, Reed High graduate, so a local guy who made good. He went out to New Hampshire as his first full-time FCS job at the time, and Chip Kelly was there. So he got to work with Chip Kelly, went to Toledo, went to Washington State, went to UCLA. He came to Nevada from UCLA where he was working with Coach Kelly. So it certainly has a lot of experience. He was on staff with uh, Coach Wilson there at Washington State. So, again, a local, uh, somebody who's, again, getting his first chance as an offensive coordinator. Obviously, last year, was not a great season for the offense. I'm sure Coach Sage will take some of the blame on himself when he sees what happened. But again, the quarterback position was not very strong. Uh, running back was strong. Offensive line and wide receiver, they were trying to figure things out. Tight end, which is his expertise. I think he's one of the best tight end coaches in the country if you look at his history. Um, you know, a kind of deficient in terms of their talent. So, um, you know, I think a lot of pressure on Coach Sage. He was the only one who got a two-year contract uh, among the assistant coaches to join uh, Coach Wilson here at Nevada, and this is the second of those two years. So he's going to have to have a group that's more productive, and he's also going to have a bigger role. I mean, Nate Costa, the quarterback's coach, resigned earlier this week. That was kind of a big shock. So Coach Sage will go from coaching the tight ends to now really helping with the quarterbacks. Uh, you know, that's not something that he's necessarily done in the past, but certainly a very good coach, and we'll see if they can get back to the Nevada standard. Nevada's offensive standard, very high. I mean, you look at the history of this program, 30 points per game plus. That's kind of what's expected, certainly with Coach Alt here. He was an offensive genius. Coach Alt goes out to practice on occasion. Um, so can Nevada get back to that 30-point standard in time, maybe two years from now? This year might be difficult to do. Yeah, you talk about the godfather of Nevada football, Chris Alt, um, kind of, you know, the architect of the pistol, and, you know, like, what Nevada football was known for, you know, was that that running not like offense. Um, yeah. Now, you know, Sage it has changed. He, you know, followed Chip Kelly from New Hampshire, went to went to UCLA under him, and you could see his, the tenets of of his offense. A lot of spread stuff, a lot of inside zone read option kind of stuff. If you have that kind of mobile quarterback, and they do in Brendan Lewis, um, but I, I actually saw Sage uh, at a function um, the, the other week, and he mentioned that they don't have 12 personnel. So, you know, a lot, not a lot, a lot of like heavy, you know, box run formations that like Nevada fans are used to seeing with, with the pistol, you know, a lot of guys just getting up front and blowing people off the ball. It's uh, definitely going to be something where, you know, you're, you're ultimately just, you know, using space and, and relying on your scat backs and, and a Sean Dollars and, and Ashton Hayes to, like, yeah. you know, break, break out those yards. Yeah, I mean, Nevada's offense in the past has been multiple. I mean, Chris Alt's the only uh, head coach in FBS history to lead the nation in rushing yards in one season and lead the nation in passing yards in one season. So best coaches – 
they fit their offense to their personnel. I don't think the personnel necessarily fit what Nevada wanted to do last year in terms of their read pass option, in terms of getting their quarterback out on the edge and making plays with his legs. Like you said, Brendan Lewis from Colorado, much more capable of doing that. So I think that's going to be key. Yeah, I don't think they have the tight ends in the offensive line quite yet to run the ball like they want to. But they've made it pretty obvious, pretty clear, that, that they want to be able to establish the run first and foremost. I mean, Nevada had some really good offenses under Jay Norvell, but didn't win any championships because they couldn't salt games away with the run game. They could not uh, punish teams with their offensive line. Yes, they had Carson Strong. Yes, they had Romeo Dobbs. Yes, they had Cole Turner, all very, very good players, which made for a very good offense, but never really got to that championship level because they didn't have that fourth quarter willpower in the run game. So I think this offense wants to be able to do both. To be quite honest, they couldn't do either last year, bottom 10 in the nation in passing efficiency, 3.3 yards per carry. You want that figure 4.5 or higher. So um, we'll see if they get there in time, but I don't think this offense wants to be skewed one way or the other. I think they want to be able to win games multiple ways, and ultimately they want to be able to win games on the ground in the fourth quarter, whether it's you know needing a couple of first downs to hold on to a lead or just being able to impose your will late in the game like we saw with Nevada against Boise State in 2010, where in that second half they just continued to run down the Broncos' uh, defensive line and had a ton of success in that way. Definitely, definitely. It's, uh, you know, it's something uh, – a balanced scheme like that is, is so important. Uh, obviously, you saw some success within the, the the Norvell era with, you know, the air raid offense and stuff like that. But, it, it you know, it came back, you know, towards them because, like, you know, you, if you don't have that run game, you're ultimately not going to be able to salt game, games away. And if you're, if you're going bombs away the entire time, yeah. you, know, you know, a three and out can happen, you know, and that just turns over the ball to the, op, you know, the opposing offense. And it's it's not, you know, you know, a balanced scheme. Well, you also look at Norvell's record against bowl quality teams. Not very good. And, you know, partially that was because the offense was a little bit more predictable to find out when you're facing better competition. Um, obviously, your record against bowl teams is going to be worse than your record against non-bowl teams. Um, but you look at the last couple of years, they did not have success against the best teams on their schedule because of that inability to run the ball. Definitely. And we'll naturally segue into the defense. Uh, you know, it, at times showed flashes last year of, of what it could be, a capable linebacking core, um, a, a unit that obviously loses Don Peterson and, and his ability up front. But um, obviously that, that unit is led by uh, Kwame and uh, Coach – Bethea. Uh, Bethea. Yep, co-defensive uh, coordinators. Co Plus, coordinators. you know, Coach Wilson came on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, I'm sure he has a lot of uh, input on what Nevada is doing defensively because it is his system that they're employing. So you have Kwame Ajaman who came from Oregon uh, with Coach Wilson. This was his first full-time FBS assistant job. He also coaches the safeties. And Mike Bethea, a very good player for Nevada in the late 2000s. His last year was 2009, so right before that breakout 2010 season. He had a number of stops along the way, including a stint as a GA at Washington State. So he was with Coach Wilson, obviously played under Coach Wilson as well. So those would be your two leaders. He coaches inside linebackers, which is probably the best position on this team, Coach Bethea. Um, but Coach Wilson, this is kind of going to be his unit. Um, you know, he's had to take on more of a role as well because Nevada lost its special teams coach during fall camp. So Coach Wilson is coaching the edge position, the outside linebacker. So he's taking on more of a role in a position kind of situation. This is not an ideal way to start the season, changing a couple of assistant positions. But, um, yeah, Nevada's defense, I think, was better than the stats showed last year. I mean, you look at the offense. The offense gave up five touchdowns with the defense on the other side scoring. And, you know, we're, we're put in a lot of very difficult positions. I think they played well enough to win a number of games, whether it was the UNLV game, whether it was the Colorado State game, um, you know, whether it was the Iowa game even. I mean, Nevada's defense really won the first two games uh, with nine takeaways in those two contests. And then they played well enough in spurts toward the back end of the season. Not a lot of success against your Boise States and your Fresno States, your Air Forces, the better teams in the Mountain West. But, um, you know, they, they do return five starters from last year. They do lose their top three tacklers. They do lose Don Peterson, top five in Nevada history in tackles for loss and sacks. So there are some holes to replace. But I, I feel like I'm probably a little bit more comfortable on the defense being average or better than the offense at this point because of the coaching expertise of Coach Wilson and then some of the personnel coming back. Definitely. And that, you know, naturally you see that in camp. Uh, defense comes out a little faster than the offense does. But especially building off last year, you know, they have that continuity. They have more players coming back. Um, whereas the offense, you're, you're kind of rebuilding the offensive line there and new quarterback. It's, it, it'll be, it'll be some, some growing pains definitely within the offense. But I think I could, we could see a, a, a great defense out there. But, uh, 
tough start, obviously, with uh, <laughs> USC. Yeah, I mean, that's not an easy way to start a season, but Nevada is getting $1.6 million. It's also kind of a nostalgia game. So the first game played at the Coliseum by USC 100 years ago this season. So this is the 100th anniversary of USC playing at the Coliseum. The first game they played there was against Cal State Pomona, which no longer has a football team. The second game they played at home at the Coliseum was against Nevada. So this was scheduled six or seven years ago, kind of to mark that historic 100th anniversary. And it is kind of interesting. That was supposed to be the first game at the Coliseum this year. USC ended up scheduling a week zero at home against San Jose State. So it kind of ruins the anniversary a little bit. And USC will have a game under its belt, which is usually advantageous heading into a week one game if you played in week zero. So that betting line, anywhere around 30 37, 38 points. Nevada's biggest underlying dog that they've ever had in its FBS history, 1992, was 32 points at Texas A&M in 2015. So this is literally the biggest underdog spread they've ever had. So we'll see if they can keep it close for maybe a quarter or two. Chris, would you say they fare better or worse than they did versus Oregon? Oh, uh, uh, I don't think they're going to lose by 71. <laughs> so, yeah, you go back to 2019, Coach Wilson on that staff, and – Nevada loses 77 to 6. So I think they'll keep it within 77 to 6. Things got out of hand really quickly in that game. It's a low bar to clear. But, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll definitely see. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then uh, the next week they uh, come back and, and play is it Kansas, right? Kansas. Uh, they'll come back home against Idaho, Idaho. and yeah. then home against Kansas right. and then at Texas State. Right. So I think you look at the non conference schedule at, as a whole. Obviously, USC is difficult. Idaho is a you know mid tier. Big Sky team, fifth in the Big Sky preseason rankings, although they do have the reigning FCS freshman of the year at quarterback. They have five all-conference players on the Big Sky preseason team, so it's a fairly talented team. Nevada has lost two games to FCS schools since 2017, so it's not a guaranteed win, including last year against Incarnate Word. Then they play at home against Kansas, terrible for 10 years. Last year they actually made a bowl. Lance Leopold's their coach, third year. Um, they have a really good quarterback coming back. So that's a home game. Nevada's first against Power 5 at home at Mackey Stadium since 2019 when they beat Purdue. And then on the road to Texas State. Texas State's not made a bowl in the last 10 seasons, but they actually hired Incarnate Word's head coach from last year. And as we said, Kenny. yep, yeah. Incarnate Word beat Nevada uh, here in Reno last year. So I think you should go 2-2 two and two during that stretch. I think if you're 3-1, and one, it's a great non-conference. If you're one in three, you're not feeling great about yourself because you should be able to pick off Texas State and Idaho. I think two and two is kind of the baseline there. But a month into the season, we should have a much better feel than we have now. It probably goes loss, win, loss, win, if I had to guess. But, you know, that's why they play the games. I didn't have them losing the Incarnate Word last year either. That's fair. And uh, you mentioned G.J. Kenny. That's, a, that's another, you know, tough uh, you know, coaching matchup. They had a, one of the most potent offenses uh, in Incarnate Word last year. In, yeah, very, very good. In the FCS. Um, so Made it'll be to interesting the final to see four. how, um, you know, he translates that offense to, to Texas State's personnel. You know, Nevada handled them quite, you know, easily last year yep. in, in their in their matchup. But you never know. College football, these, you know, these turnarounds could be quick. So mm -hmm. that could be end up being a sneaky, uh, you know, competitive Tough game. game. And it's over in your old neck of the woods, right? San oh, Marcos. Yeah. Yeah, you spent yeah. some time in Austin. No, but those are not. No, yeah, I, I spent some time in Austin, Texas. It is a very hot place. And, um, <laughs> yeah, you know, especially that time of year, you, you think, oh, yeah, like September, you know, it's going to be you know, nice and cool. Yeah, nah. it's not. No, no, no. It's, and we haven't really had like hot weather like, here, so yeah, exactly. Nevada might not be broken into that heat, that humidity. And that's where depth comes into effect. You asked Coach Wilson, why did Nevada lose a number of close games last year? He'd say lack of depth, fourth quarter, couldn't play their best because they were worn out. So that'll be interesting. Does that depth help? when you go on the road to a Texas state in a hot and humid environment. And will that, you know, will they be able to sustain longer? Um, will be something interesting to watch there. I definitely think they have more depth this year with all their, their transfers in um, a lot of Pac-12 guys. And uh, we'll see, you know, like the, the, the humidity definitely affects, you know, those, those uh, long range sprinting guys like receivers and corners. And luckily they got um, a bunch of additions there. Yeah. You want to talk about those guys? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, first off, we'll talk. Uh, we'll talk about the additions, and then we'll jump into the departures. Okay. But, uh, um, let's uh, let's start with those Pac-12 guys who kind of success. Yeah, there's 14 of them. I don't know if I can name them all off the top of my head. You have Brandon Lewis at quarterback. You have Sean Dollars and Ashton Hayes at running back. John Jackson the third and Isaiah Crocker at wide receiver. Kaleki Latu at tight end. Joey Rodriguez on the offensive line. So there's eight right there on offense, and I think that's where they focused getting better personnel. Brendan Lewis should start against USC, 
played a full season at Colorado 2021, had a pretty solid year for a redshirt freshman, started the season opener last year and then got pulled, went, hit the transfer portal. Colorado ended up going 1-11, in so maybe not the best decision to pull him there. I think your running back, Sean Dollars, Ashton Hayes, those are really nice pieces to replace Toa Tau and Devontae Lee. Ashton Hayes has a ton of speed. We saw him here at Damani Ranch in McQueen. It's if Can they get him some holes? That's the big question on the offensive line. I think you look at wide receiver. I think Delvon Campbell could have a really nice season. He played for Nevada last year after transferring from Illinois, six foot four kid. I think he could be an all conference player. We'll see with John Jackson and Isaiah Crocker. These are both six year players. They didn't play a lot at their previous schools, USC for Jackson and then Oregon for Crocker. So that's a big question mark. Can they be more productive in the Mountain West? I think Kalecki Latu at tight end. He should start. He should have a big impact. He actually played pretty significant snaps at Cal uh, Rodriguez, the offensive lineman from USC. I think he could play at right tackle maybe right out of the gates um so you know not a lot of these guys establish themselves in the pac-12 so it's kind of like if you take pac-12 not scout team players a little bit higher than that but maybe third string players and you put them in the mountain west how will they fare i think we're going to get the answer with nevada this season because of how many additions they've had on that offense and all those guys i listed should have some kind of a big role for the Wolfpack this season. Definitely. And we, we listed Dollars and Ashton Hayes, kind of like big guys coming out of high school. Obviously, Hayes, a, a local kid. Um, that kind of, you know, like you think about their skill sets and they're, you know, like more scat and speed guys. And the you think about the, the running backs that, that Nevada lost last year, some some key staples in the Nevada offense and uh, Devontae Lee and Toa Tawa. Yeah. And those were uh, more bowling ball kind of yeah. like, you know, running backs that all, you know, get the hard yards. Um it's it's interesting to how they, that 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 running back room has has changed in the year. Yeah, that is an interesting yeah. take on that because, like you said, Toa and Devontae were more between the tackles, and Dollars and Hayes are more you know could line up in the slot. Honestly, you want to get them in space, you want to get them on the edge. So who's going to fill that between the tackles role? I asked Vitawa there. I think they're still searching. They have Wesley Comer who came here as a walk on, maybe more between the tackles. Cross Patton, uh, Oregon transfer, who was on the team last year. He's more of like an edge guy, about five foot six. Um, you know, they do have a freshman, Connor Noah. Maybe he steps into that role. Um, but yeah, between the tackles is, is really the big question mark about those running backs. You know, can they get the short yardage yards? Can they break off the first tackle and continue to fall forward, which is what Toa and Devontae did last year? Um, I think you got more speed and explosiveness in the backfield, but do you necessarily have that physicality that the Wolfpack has had with Toa Tawa? Definitely. And, uh, It'll be interesting to see. I mean, we're, again, 10 days out when that first third and one situation comes out. You know, like, are they going to, you know, like, go up the middle with the with the dollars or haze? We'll see how they fare, you know. And, uh, we again, we haven't seen them do it at a college football level. Um, they were buried in their uh, in respective depth charts. Um, but, yeah, we, we will see. And uh, another guy we mentioned is at Kalecki Latu. I've, I've heard good things about him. And, uh, you know, they like they like his size. He's 6'7". He has a, he has a, a thinner frame. But, again, like, that's, that's great size. And not too dissimilar from Cole Turner when he was here um, with, uh, you know, Norvell. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely more of a Cole Turner tight end than, like, a Virgil Green tight end. Uh, in terms of more pass oriented than run block oriented. And, you know, they have some other pieces who can maybe do that run blocking, but I'm sure they would like to see Kalecki improve in that area and really pitch in in that area. But yeah, in terms of getting in the seam and being able to threaten, uh, you know, whether it's an inside linebacker or a nickel safety, I think that could be very advantageous given his size and his ball skills. So would not be surprised if you see him catch 25, 30 balls, four or five touchdowns this year, which would be an improvement on what he did at Cal last season. Now we jump into like the, the people that have to defend this uh, six seven mammoth uh, the defensive backs. Uh, Nevada lost Bentley Sanders, one of the you know like more active uh, safeties they had in in the back end in, in some time. I mean he, he was he was a ball hawk back there. Um, kind of talk about some of the you know reinforcements that came in the secondary and uh, how they could potentially. You know, impact. Yeah, I mean, that's the big question mark, because not only was it Bentley, it was Tyson Williams, who was a multi-year starter, it was Tyreek Max. So those are your top three tacklers from last year. I think internal growth and replacements is probably going to be the path that they end up taking. They did add Trey Weed, who was a cornerback at Eastern Washington, probably going to play safety, probably nickel at Nevada. He's a six-year player. He has a lot of experience. He has 36 career starts. That's actually the most of any Nevada offensive or defensive player. Yeah, it happened at the FCS level, but he was very productive. 
I think Amani Johnson is someone who could step up, who was on the team last year. He's a six-year player. Zeke Robbins, somebody in his fifth year of college, he could step into a starting role. So there aren't any firm answers in the secondary other than Trey Weed. I think he's going to play uh, and be very productive. But that's the big question mark. And then you look at the front side of the defense, after we talk about the back side and that defensive line, losing Don Peterson. The big question is who comes up and replaces him. I did co uh, speak with their uh, defensive line coach, Al Lapuano, um, who everybody seems to love. He's a very good coach on the defensive line, was part of Utah State's Mountain West Championship team two years ago. And he said it's going to have to be more of a by-committee approach, but it seems like Deion Washington, Henry Ikehihifo, and then uh, Elijah Winston, I would say, are your probably top three edge defensive line players who could emerge as a very havoc-wreaking defensive lineman, maybe an all-conference player. But it's going to be seven or eight guys on that defensive line who have to help replace what Dom gave them last season. But I am really high on Deion Washington. He was a retro freshman last year, uh, started about half the games, uh, was a very good wrestler in Las Vegas in high school. I think this is a guy who could be an all-conference player and make a lot of pressure up the middle because he plays more the defensive tackle position than the defensive end position. Yeah, Dion, excellent wrestler. Uh, we had actually caught up with Dion for our five question series and uh, Chris asked, uh, you know, Dion, how long it would take him to, to wrestle him to the ground, pin him? It would take... Uh, he what, said 15, 15, 15 seconds. 15 seconds. I think he gave me too much credit. I know. I mean, come on. <laughs> you seem like a medicine well, guy. Well, the wrestling yeah. ring is not very big. We've got a carpet down here. It's probably about the size of that. So I don't really have anywhere to run. So I think he'd take no. me down pretty quick. No, but Al can. raved about him. I mean, he said Deion Washington can be as good as Deion Washington wants to be. The only person who can block Deion Washington is Deion Washington. That's a lot of me saying Deion Washington. But he does seem like the next Dom Peterson, you know, the next Dante Moak. Uh, you know, the next uh, Brock Hecking, Lenny Jones, Ian Seau. I mean, Nevada's had a lot of really good defensive linemen. Malik Reed, um, you know, different because he plays on the interior. A lot of those guys play on the edge. And I think if you can get pressure from the interior, it makes you even more valuable. So mm -hmm. I think um, he's a guy who, you know, might not be all conference this year, but he has three years of eligibility after this. So he's going to be all conference, I think, at some point. So in terms of vibes, like we talk about Brock Hecking. I mean, that was that was an epic time, man. Like the, yeah, very good vibes. The, the blonde flow, the the like you know the Oakley glasses. And yeah, he just you the know face he, paint on the face. Oh man, you know if he wasn't like that, that his first couple of years. It really <laughs> blossomed uh, toward the end. Yeah, think of the NIL deals he could have got back in the day. Oh, excellent. I mean, at least you know, you know, some sort of partnership with WWE. Yeah. Or, you know, just uh, or even like uh, you know, what's that? Uh, the Paul Malu, like, you know, like, yeah, yeah. Deal oh, he's got a hair deal. Yeah. You know, that, I mean, that's why I'm in favor of the NILs, though, because Brock goes to the NFL. He has a foot injury, several surgeries, doesn't really get to, you know, make a name and make a lot of money there. So if he could have cashed in, a, you know, a few hundred thousand a year, that really would have helped him in the future. So that's a little bit of an off topic discussion. But one of the reasons why I think NIL is important for these student athletes is because even if you are a great college player like Brock was and you go to the NFL, you are one injury away from basically not making any money as a professional being 24, 25 years old with a lot of medical bills trying to figure out, you know, where do I go from here? Certainly if you were able to capitalize on how productive you were in college, that sets you up for the future, puts you in a better place in case you are one of those cautionary tales where you just get an injury that really limits what you can do as a professional. Certainly. And we always think about NIL as, as something that like kind of poaches talent from, from middle tier, tier schools like us, but that is a nice part of, you know, that entire like setup because yeah. you know athletes do deserve the college athletes deserve to get paid you know they deserve to you know capitalize off that name image and likeness um anyways to steer back on on course uh you also mentioned elijah elijah winston i saw elijah at, at practice and uh you know a former usc guy quick twitch guy that goes off the edge and i asked him uh you know what how many sacks you're getting this year and he said i'm breaking the record 15 and a half Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's a, you know, that's, that's a pretty big talk. But uh, One and a half a game? Yeah, exactly. He's, <laughs> a, he's got you got to start with his versus his old team. But uh, I, I did enjoy watching him grow as an edge rusher last year. Obviously, he started out as, as a linebacker, um, but you know, quickly moved to the edge towards the end. And you could see the foundation there. You could see his uh, the quick twitch and, and the bend around the edge that uh, you need to, uh, you know, get, get sacks on the quarterback. Yeah, I think he'd have a really good season. Six year of college, so another one of those more experienced guys didn't really play at the beginning of last year because they brought him here as more of an inside linebacker which is what he started high school and then college at USC had moved him more to an edge in their camp prior to last season 
he ended up transferring to Nevada. They moved him back to inside linebacker and then put him back at edge. So he was kind of moving around all over the place. But really the second half of last season, I thought he played really well. And I think he can be one of those guys who can be one of the more productive players on this defense. Now, edge is a pretty deep position for Nevada. They're probably going to rotate five or six guys through that position. But if it were me, I mean, I'm obviously not getting all of the inside. I would put him right there as the starting edge, see if he can be super productive over 35, 40 plays, and see if he can sustain through a full season. I'll take the under on 15 and a half sacks, but I think he will have a solid year. I know that's yeah, that's <laughs> that's a lot. You know, I mean, uh, especially in college. I mean, NFL, you can see those those sacks being hit like that, but uh, college, you'll see like a lot of like you know three to five sack seasons, and it's not an indictment on no. on on the players because. Teams are rotating so much that uh, you're not getting as much. Yeah, I mean, it's good to get to 10. If you can get to double-digit sacks, that's a huge season in college. I mean, first of all, 12 games as opposed to 17. Maybe you get a Mountain West championship in a bowl game. Um, But, yeah, it it seems like – and especially last year, like with Don Peterson, everybody would throw two guys on him. And I don't think Nevada has that this year, which makes it interesting on that defensive line, is who's going to soak up that defensive or offensive attention, playbook attention, scheming attention, to really help everybody else go out there and, and feed and get their production. They don't have that guy right now, but we'll see how that kind of develops throughout the year. We'll see. And we'll, we'll do a deep dive on the entire defense in, in, in the coming episodes. But, uh, you know, we kind of talk about bowl games and, and you know, some sit, like high statistics and stuff like that. But uh, if you had to go through the schedule right now as it stands today, what what is your, like, record prediction for this team? Yeah, I think it's five or six wins. So I'll be generous. I'll give Nevada a six win somewhere along the line. And I think the schedule is actually very advantageous. We talked about the non-conference schedule. I think there are two wins there if you go and you play good football. And then you get into the conference schedule, so eight games. Nevada does not play Boise State, who has picked to win the Mountain West in the preseason poll. They do not play Air Force, which is picked to finish second in the Mountain West in the preseason poll. And they do not play San Jose State, which was picked fifth in the Mountain West in the preseason poll. So three of the top five teams not on your schedule. You look at the home schedule in conference, pretty advantageous. You've got New Mexico, which didn't win a game in the Mountain West last year at home. You've got Hawaii at home. They're 2-9 and nine all-time in Reno. Home field advantage, very big in that series. You've got UNLV at home. They're breaking in a first-year head coach. That's not usually a very strong program. So you should be able to run the table in your home conference games. You also have Wyoming at home. That's going to be a more difficult one. I think Nevada probably wins three Mountain West games at home, two games in non-conference. That puts them at five. And then we'll give them either one road win or maybe they upset Wyoming here at Mackey Stadium. And if they do that, then they get to the six wins that get them to a bowl, and that's kind of what we're marking as a successful season. So without going game by game throughout it, I do think six wins is feasible. And, you know, you look at the advanced, met- advanced metrics like ESPN's Football Power Index, they project Nevada to win five and a half games. Um, they give them, I think, a 45% chance of winning the six and being bowl eligible, 3% chance of winning the Mountain West. We'll see if that happens. So I think – you know, the, I don't know about the betting line and where it's at now. You said two and a half earlier, but I think the majority of your projections are saying right around five to six wins, right in between there. Mm. And we'll see if they can bump up, maybe get to that six victory. Okay. And that's that's a realistic, like, take, you know. Um, let's play kind of a metaphorical game. And we'll start at the bottom end because, you know, we always want to end on, like, a high note for the okay. fans and stuff like that. But uh, uh, ultimately, doomsday. Terrible season, absolute floor for this team. What does that look like? What's the worst case scenario, or what happens to to lead to that worst case? Yeah, what case can scenario? happen? You know, like obviously, like a Lewis injury, or like yeah. That. I mean, the quarterback play could be subpar again, yeah. as we mentioned to start this thing. Nevada had more interceptions than passing touchdowns last year, eight to seven. Um, so there's still uncertainty there, and then losing your quarterbacks coach with a pretty young room is not the best way to enter the season. Um, I think the offensive line, 37 career starts among those guys coming back. That's one of the fewest in the FBS. So I'd say the offensive line doesn't gel. They have some struggles there. That leads to the quarterback maybe getting hurt or not playing up to his potential. That leads to the run game not being as productive as it should be with quality of running back back there. And then your wide receivers, who there's some nice names in there but don't have a lot of proven production. B.J. Castile, a top player from last year's team, not on this year's team. They're not able to play at a super high level, and the tight end lack of depth also rears its ugly head. So let's say Nevada averages right around 20 points per game this year, pretty similar to last year. And then I guess what could go wrong on defense? I think that defensive line is the big question in terms of can you stop the run and can you rush the pass rusher? You know, Can you get after the quarterback? Um, there's still some questions on whether that will be able to happen without Don Peterson. So if that front's not strong and you have questions at safety, 
Maybe you're stuck giving up 30 points per game like they did last year, and you don't take advantage of a pretty mediocre schedule. So, you know, the worst case scenario, probably another like two win season, and they really struggle against, you know, Mountain West competition. I don't think that's going to happen, but I think if the offensive line and the defensive line, which is where you win championships, isn't super strong, and there's reason to have questions about whether it's super strong, if they don't play well, then maybe Nevada doesn't take that step forward that a lot of people are expecting. All right, ship gears, best case. Uh, if how, everything goes perfectly. Does, everything's perfect, you know, like it's unexpected. Ken, Ken Wilson's dancing on the sidelines, you know, the, tri <laughs> the Tridents make an appearance every every Saturday in, in Mackey, and, you know, it's just, just the vibes are great. You know? Yeah, so let's go back to the line. Angus McClure in town. So he was Nevada's former offensive line coach, went to Cal for three seasons. He's back as offensive line coach. He's got three decades of experience, one of the better offensive line coaches in the West Coast. Um, so maybe that offensive line plays a lot better than you would expect. Brendan Lewis's legs make the offensive line look better because I know the offensive line takes a lot of criticism the last couple of years. Carson Strong and then Nate Cox and Shane Ellingworth, they weren't necessarily known for their legs, so it kind of made their job difficult, especially because Carson's last year here, he was dealing with his leg injury, his knee injury. Um, so if that offensive line plays well and Brendan Lewis's athleticism buys them a little bit more time, gives them a little bit more margin for error, and they get that run game going, um, you know, I think that's what has to happen on offense. And then maybe your wide receivers, your John Jackson, the thirds, your Isaiah Crockers are able to step in because they were both really highly rated guys coming out of high school. If they add some explosiveness to the offense uh, and, you know, you get up maybe to 27 points per game. Um, I think on defense, it's got to be about takeaways. Nevada uh, was great last year when they had a 9-0 advantage in takeaways their first two games. I think over their last... 10 games, they had something like 11 takeaways. So more or less one per game instead yeah. of four and a half per game. Mm -hmm. So they're going to have to go and take the ball away. I think their middle linebackers are very good. Drew Watts, Naki Matialona, Jackson LaDuke. I think there's strength there. I think they've returned their two cornerbacks, Isaiah Sissima, Jaden Dedman. So you've got some positions of strength to play from. But if they can get those takeaways, maybe be plus 15 on the year, which can sometimes be fluky. I think, you know, that's the best case scenario. And probably from a win total perspective, I think eight and four is probably your best case scenario. Um, you know, you have USC, which is probably a loss. And then you have Kansas, Fresno State, and San Diego State, which are very difficult games. So those are the four that I think are going to be very difficult to win. Um, the rest of them are actually fairly winnable games. Yeah, they'll probably be a fairly, you know, good size underdog against Wyoming, but that's at home. So there is a path to where if Nevada plays good football, the schedule would allow for them to maybe go eight and four. And I think that would be a, a huge success. I think you would see Ken Wilson dancing on the sidelines. If they go eight and four, make it to a bowl, get back to Fremont Cannon, if they check all of those off, then you know, that's as good of a season as I think Wolfpack fans can expect. A complete 180 from last year. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's it's very sad vibes last year. And, uh, <laughs> I'm a big vibes guy. And, uh, okay. It's, uh, you know. It's much needed, but yeah, again, that that would that would definitely be the ceiling with this team, and uh, definitely, again, like even if it's five or six wins, that's a, that's a step in the right direction, especially when you're building from scratch. And uh, again, you have Brendan Lewis under your control for the next, you know, two three years. Yeah. Obviously, any kind of transfer aside, but again, like to have a man, uh, a quarterback that has that type of experience at the Power Five level. And to have that much time remaining uh, in in college football is is you know it's a luxury for Nevada, and again they do have a talented um, quarterback room, which we'll get into in our offensive breakdown. Yeah, I mean I think ideally you want to be able to compete for a championship every year, but you look at the history of Nevada football really since 2000, it's five year cycles. It seems like every five years the kind of the core is put in place to win a championship. They win the WAC title in 2005, kind of have to rebuild a little. Win the WAC title in 2010 kind of have to rebuild a little 2015 actually 2014 they had a game at home against fresno state that if they won they get to the mountain west championship game they didn't get it done then you flash forward to 2020 21 the carson strong romeo dobbs cole turner years they lose that game to san jose state in 2020 if they win that they're in the mountain west championship obviously 2021 they lose three conference games by two points each those fortunes change there in the Mountain West Championship. So I think if you're projecting forward, you're probably looking 2025 if you're in that five-year cycle of maybe having a championship caliber team. But to be able to get there, you have to take your baby steps. You have to go from two wins, maybe to five or six wins, maybe to seven or eight wins, and then maybe to a 10-win team when you, you know, can truly compete for a championship. So we've seen some weird winners in the Mountain West 
recently. You go back 2020, San Jose State won. Nobody had them winning. That was a terrible program before Brent Brennan took over. You go back to 2021, Utah State, Blake Anderson's team. They were absolutely horrible the year before that. They win a Mountain West championship upsetting San Diego State. So maybe there is a surprise on the horizon. I think outside of Boise State, the rest of the Mountain West is fairly vulnerable. Fresno State loses Jay Kaner. San Diego State took a big step back last year. Air Force loses uh, Brad Roberts, who led the nation in rushing last year, and their quarterback, Zeke Daniels. So there's not really, outside of Boise State, a team I would say has top 40, let alone top 25 potential in the Mountain West. So maybe there is a way with Nevada, with its improved roster, with its weaker schedule and conference, has a chance to shock everybody and maybe get to a Mountain West championship game. We will see. But like I said, typically a five-year cycle is what we've seen really the last 20 years. Stranger things have happened. Mm. And uh, when you're in the Mountain West and playing late, you never know. <laughs> that's, the, that's the glory of it. And obviously we know everything about the conference realignment, and that's a conversation for another day. But um, it should be an interesting few years here under, under Ken Wilson. Obviously subject to change. We never know how these things go. Again, they could be dancing on the sidelines or could be just, you know, utter sadness. Or crying on the sidelines. Yeah, exactly. Which I've actually so. seen that before. Uh, 2012 Arizona Bowl, Chris Salt's last game. Uh, they're up by 13 with less than 90 seconds to go. Uh, give up a touchdown. Onside kick goes off Duke Williams' chest. Arizona scores another touchdown, two touchdowns in about 30 seconds. Uh, and I go down to the sideline when all of that's happening to get ready to capture the celebration. Instead of a celebration, I saw tears as people walked off the field. So that's always very sad. There's a huge emotional investment into a football scene. There's a huge physical investment. These guys practice so many hours for these 12 opportunities and games to go out there and win games and make their community proud. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll see if that investment pays off this year. Last year, it obviously didn't. There were some very invested players who wanted to stay with Nevada after the coaching change and were very loyal to the Wolfpack. Unfortunately, their efforts were not rewarded. Um, but, you know, you always hate to see a team have to go through a season like that because of how much work goes into playing a football game, let alone 12 over a full season. Yeah, it only comes once a week, yep. you know, one opportunity. And, uh, yeah, hope, hopefully, you know, we get a, get a better season than we did last year. Um, and you and I both think that they will. Yeah. Uh, final record prediction. I'm going 6-6. Six and six. Okay. So we'll come back at the end of the year and see if that was accurate. You know, what is yours? Eternal op put it, Optimist. Put it on me. Yeah, so uh, – Seven and five. Seven and five. Yeah, man. One so better. Five hundred. Yeah. Okay, what bowl then? We both have them going to bowls. Let's go uh, Jimmy Kimmel Bowl. Jimmy Kimmel Bowl. Again, I, I think that's for like the top team. Yeah, that's a big. Well, but there's a if the top team gets to the New Year's Six, then they got no, it back. Fair. They got it back. Yeah. I'm gonna go one of the. I mean, it's one of those. Uh, let's say. I mean, you got New Mexico, you got Arizona, you got Hawaii, and you got Potato Bowl. So Nevada has not been to New Mexico in a while. So let's say New Mexico Bowl. Okay. Uh, all-time favorite bowl. My all-time favorite bowl that yeah. I've covered. That oh, just I've... just in general, because you know it's a cool thing. You know, it's been diminished obviously since yeah. the, since the college. I mean, I think the Rose started, Bowl. But... Anybody who grows up in the West Coast loves the okay. Rose Bowl. I would say obviously the 2010 craft, craft Fight Hunger Bowl, where Nevada yeah. beat Boston College, 30,000 Wolfpack fans at what is now called Oracle, the home of the San Francisco Giants. That yeah. was an incredible experience. Um, the seating for the media was terrible. It was like behind home plate, so it was like behind one of the end zones. Uh, the food was okay. We got like sourdough sandwiches from, mm. I think Bodine is the name of the. Right. Yeah. You've so, been all over the Mountain West. That's so. I've been all over the Mountain West. And you're like if you had to like do a power ranking of, you know, we're kind of jumping segments here. But, yeah, honestly, uh, that's a like, different show. You know, you could do a power ranking of food spreads. You know, uh, food, like off top, like who had the best. Food usually, spread San and, Diego like, State. Like, also, Air like. Force is the only press box in the Mountain West that has hot chocolate. Oh, I'm a big hot chocolate okay. fan because I don't drink coffee. So I, I very much appreciate that, and it's gen, generally very cold there for yeah. football games. Um, but, yeah, San Diego State has an ice cream machine. Okay. Well, they did. So this year, Nevada will play at Snapdragon Stadium. Opened last year. This will be Nevada's first game at Snapdragon Stadium. So I'm guessing there is no longer an ice cream machine in the, the media room, but I'm not sure about that. Like every McDonald's in the world. Yeah. Come on. You know, so not, not that'll be a, that'll be a new experience. And I'll, I'll I'll call out Nevada right now, not not in a bad way, but come on, man, like better food. There's no food <laughs> options. The the soda machine doesn't even work. Uh, it's just like shooting out just water. Yeah, like give us some love, man. Yeah, We're up there. It's a long day. Away. It's a long it's a long day. You know, most most of those games are four hours. I need you're some there a couple man. hours beforehand, a couple hours afterhand. It, yeah. It's a long. Come people on, don't want to hear about the media complaining about not having food though. So that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> but you know, good eats. Like I, I like I'm a foodie. I, I, I like my, uh, my my beverages when I'm watching a game. Yeah. 
much like the the average fan on yeah. the you know on the concourse there. So. I would also say San Diego State for the basketball games. I'll give you like a uh, voucher basically to go to any of the concessions, and you can have whatever food you want. So that's nice. You're not necessarily stuck with one genre. So San Diego State knows how to mm. do food for the media. Yes, and that you know, that's all I ask. Okay, that's all I ask. Well, thanks for joining us, guys. Um, first episode of Inside the Den. Uh, broke down the team and uh, remember to subscribe if you're on YouTube uh, leave us a rating and review if you're listening on Spotify or Apple uh, and again yeah spread the word we're, we're out here we're covering Nevada football um, Nevada basketball in the winter we'll have guests and uh, yeah it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a fun um, experience with the inside the deck. good for a show yeah decent you know uh, just nice. let us know if it, if, it, if it wasn't up to standard <laughs> let, let me know at me on on a on Twitter, Jared is the dude, um, or X. I don't know. I don't know what they're doing nowadays. Mm-hmm. But just at me and say, "Hey, this wasn't up to par," and uh, I'll work on it, man. <laughs> I I owe it to you. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna at you. I'm gonna say it's not up to par. No, I'm kidding. I enjoyed <laughs> it. Uh, thank you for putting this together. And obviously, we're gonna have a lot of shows throughout the season. Definitely. All right. We'll see you next time. <laughs>